just to introduce you to the people on the stage. On the far left, Professor Peter Ryan from the Fitzpatrick Institute, who is our president. Professor Chifalaro, our vice president. Pam Barrett, our company secretary. Mark Anderson, our CEO. And my name is Vernon Head, and I'm the chairman of BirdLife. If I can ask for the next slide, please. To identify a bird, to know its name is enjoyable and satisfying. One of the main reasons, one of the big reasons why we, we, we're on this cruise. But to watch it inquiringly, perhaps in the way that Peter Harrison watches birds, with questions in your mind, gives one something a little more. Perhaps it's a powerful connection with the natural world and with that comes a concern for conservation. So it's, it's with, with great pride really and for me to announce that just having you all here in the audience this afternoon and being part of what we have built this event as Flock at Sea has meant that we've put 200,000 Rand in the bank for the Albatross Task Force for Conservation. If I can have a round of applause. <laughs> if you look at that graph, you can see there's trouble on the seas. And um, as South Africans, with a country with a wonderful coastline that we do have, and oceans down in the south that we do have, and what we're experiencing right now, and what you've heard over the last few days, I just thought it's important that we start things off bearing that in mind. Okay, then on to the business of, of the meeting. Item one, apologies. We have received apologies and they have been noted. I don't know if there are any more apologies that we need to note. Thank you. Uh, then, the approval of the minutes of the 83rd Annual General Meeting. If I can have a proposal for those, if I can... Aha, uh -huh. Alex Barrow, thank you. And a seconder. Thank you, Don Barrow. Fortunately, I know where people are sitting. <laughs> you can hardly see. Um, then, um, any, any matters arising from these minutes that require attention? Thank you very much. Um, it's now my pleasure to ask the President of BirdLife South Africa to give his address. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Vernon. They made me sit right over the far side so you could see me walk across the floor with my shoes on. <laughs> I was given strict instructions. I had to wear a jacket and shoes, but I've got a jacket. I'm just not wearing it. But, uh, I went out and bought these shoes specially, so I hope you appreciate the gesture. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to Flock 2013. And if we can roll the images. Oh, I'm in charge. Oh, yeah. That's dangerous. Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, this has been, without doubt, the most ambitious, and I venture to suggest the most successful AGM that BirdLife and its predecessor, the Southern African Ornithological Society, has ever hosted. Traditionally, AGMs are rather state affairs, and we're lucky if we get even a few hundred people to attend. So I think this was a masterstroke on Vernon and Mark's part to launch <laughs> I hadn't quite finished. Um, <laughs> obviously, behind Vernon and, uh, and Mark's sits a very large team, and I think we really need to thank all of the team who put this together. It's been a mammoth task. You can see by the difficulty that uh, MSC has getting people on and off the ship. It's not an easy thing to get this many bird watchers together. And uh, despite a few hiccups with boarding and dis disembarking, I think uh, it's all gone remarkably smoothly, even to the extent of having lousy weather, so you're all forced to come to the ADA. <laughs> I'm supposed to be driving this 
interesting. And even even the weather played part at the beginning, and we had a marvelous send off. And I believe that these images were beamed around South Africa and who knows via Facebook all over the world. So it's been my privilege over the last uh, three years to serve as president of BirdLife South Africa. And many of you who know me will have been somewhat surprised when I was asked to stand in this role and perhaps somewhat shocked when I actually accepted because I'm not really very keen on standing in front of large audiences unless I'm talking about birds per se. Um, however, as many of you know to your cost, Mark is a very hard man to say no to, and so here I am three years later. I've been very fortunate that it's been an easy task for me over the last three years to serve as president. Bird life has grown considerably in recent years and is now more than ever making a difference for birders and more importantly for birds. However, there are still many challenges ahead and I shall return to some of these at the end of my address. This is why I don't like doing this sort of drive out. Thank you very much. So presidential addresses are tricky things. Um, it was really quite, quite hard to think what to talk about. The first time I gave a presidential address, Mark said, talk about something you're passionate about. So I talked about seabirds and their conservation. And here's a really shocking picture of a lace and albatross chick from Midway that died of plastic ingestion. And I'm really pleased that by having flock at sea, so many of you were able to come out to sea and albeit distantly, to begin to appreciate why we love these birds so much and spend so much time trying to look after them. Uh, for my second presidential address, I challenged us to look at global change and suggested that we need to work together to push governments to actually ta tackle the challenges of global warming in particular, and also to look at our own lives and to consider how we could individually make a difference, but ultimately it's going to require very serious action on a large scale and top-down forcing to have any sort of effect. <coughs> Which brings me to the subject of this uh, third and final presidential address. And I thought what I'd do is I'd look back over, in particular the last year, and look at some of the high and the low points of what has happened over this period. And unfortunately for me personally, and I'm sure for many of you in the audience, one of the one of the highlights, or not the highlight, but one of the, the main feature that you think of when you think of the last year is, is the very untimely passing of uh, my long-time colleague and friend, Professor Phil Hockey, who would have been here with us um, and would have been enjoying himself, as I'm sure all of you have enjoyed yourselves. Phil and I shared what I would call a, a friendly birding rivalry for the last 30 years or so, ever since uh, I was a... Uh, a lowly student at the University of Cape Town, and was a PhD student. And I just want to run through a few images uh, to remind us of Phil and his long career. Phil was pretty much happiest, I think, when he was out in the bush playing with his latest toy. Phil always had a, a veritable fleet of vehicles, from sports cars through to off-road vehicles. And this obviously arose at an early age. It's a great picture of Phil as a little kid growing up in the UK. Phil came to South Africa initially to work with Ron Summers when he was still an undergraduate student himself at Langabarn looking at white fronted plovers and then returned to conduct his PhD research on African oyster catchers. And this is Phil back in 1979 when he first arrived in South Africa sharing his new house on Marcus Island with Manfred Lautner, an old stalwart of the Western Cape Oyster Study Group. And as you all know, Phil went on to make a very successful career out of studying and ultimately conserving African black oyster catchers and touched many people around the country through that work. And for most birders, I think we'll remember Phil through the many books that he produced, not least the seventh revision of Roberts and his contribution to Sass and Field Guide, but also the later books, books on penguins. He was a very prolific author and was awarded many times for his contribution to popularizing science. But Phil did lots of other things as well. He trained many students over the years, and some of his students are sitting here in this audience, some of the best ornithologists in the country were trained by Phil. 
And to me, the saddest thing about Phil's untimely death was the fact that I think in the last five years, he was probably the happiest I've ever seen him. Um, he took on the mantle of director of the Institute, and he married Samantha, and he really was just blossoming and having a, a wonderful time. And it's, it's really such a shame. He's left an amazing legacy, but it's, it's frightening to think what he could have done had he been given another decade or two. He steered the Institute through its 50th anniversary celebrations, bringing out David Attenborough to come and talk in South Africa, which was a wonderful success. And he even managed to convince skeptics like the uh, Minister of Science and Technology <laughs> as to the importance of birds and their conservation. But ultimately, Phil was a fit man through and through, and uh, never shirked at the opportunity to go and sample a few beers here and there. And I think this is how probably most of us will remember Phil, sitting around the bar, telling stories. Um, he was a wonderful raconteur, and he will never be forgotten. I think it's kind of fitting that on a seabird cruise, probably the best birds we've seen were shorebirds, and I think Phil's up there laughing at us at this time. So I'd just like to ask you to have just a few moments of silence to reflect on the life of Phil and the impact he's had on all of us. Thanks very much. A lot more positive things from a birding perspective. It was quite an exciting year last year. We had a couple of new birds for the sub-region. There was this long-staying little crake that pitched up in Clavelli. It pleased lots of people, including Phil. It was the second last Southern African bird. And a not quite so obliging black skimmer, but uh, for those who saw it, very enjoyable. That pitched up briefly in Cape Town and then put in a brief appearance in Walpers Bay, a bit like us at the moment. But more interesting than these fleeting vagrants is the fact that we've added two new birds to the subregion as breeding species, seemingly. Certainly, this discovery of cave chats occurring in the Zebra Mountains was quite unexpected. This was previously considered to be an Angolan endemic. And Vessant Swanepoel is to be congratulated for finding a population of these birds. This is one of John Graham's pictures taken in December this year of a bird carrying food to a nest. So certainly a resident breeding population. And then even more recently, Hugh Chittenden and Greg Davies somewhat serendipitously stumbled on a group of green tinkerbirds that seemingly have got quite a stable population. And I don't know whether you've heard the story, but they spent four days camping out in fine looking habitat, looking for this bird, getting rained on every day. Eventually got tired and miserable, left the place, and just took a random track, saw some Livingston's flycatchers, stopped to photograph them, and heard these birds calling. So I guess my message here is that there's still a lot to be learned about birds in our region and I would encourage you not to just go back to the same old haunts where we know where things are but actually to go out and explore because who knows what else is out there if we go and look for these things. Another highlight of the last year has been the addition of a couple of really new and exciting publications to help us as bird watchers. First was Hugh Chittenden and Dave Allen's book, illustrated by Ingrid Weyersby, two of the authors on board, um, looking at geographic variation of birds in Southern Africa. Wonderful to see all of the more strikingly differentiated populations illustrated for the first time. And then, for those of you who haven't seen it, just coming out at the end of the year, Fancy Peacock's Sublime book from LBJ's. If you haven't seen it, do yourself a favor, have a look. Just, just go and buy one. It's absolutely wonderful. All of those things that you couldn't identify before, now you can identify or at least have a good stab at. We've also seen the advent of BirdLife's own in-house magazine. Um, hopefully you enjoy that. I can't say too much because I'm a little bit involved in that. Um, that was the first issue. The second issue you've already seen. And hopefully by the time you get home, if you haven't seen it already, this one will be sitting in your mailboxes to read. And I'd particularly like to thank Darby Chamberlain for his guidance and contributions in making this a reality. I think the demise of Africa Birds and Birding left a gap that uh, Mark was brave enough to tackle and with Darby's support hopefully we'll go from strength to strength with your support as well. Of 
if you're going to be going out bird watching and using all these new tools and exploring all these new areas. There's no point doing it if you don't share that information. So please, we say this every year, but please contribute your data through the various citizen science programs, most notably the Bird Atlas. I've just heard today the terribly shocking news that the financial straits of the ADU are threatening the position of the Atlas coordinator and several other posts there, so it's not a very happy situation. On the plus side, Botswana, um, sorry, not Botswana, Namibia and Zimbabwe are coming on board with the bird atlas. So on the one hand, we're seeing the, the area expand, but we, we do need critical funding for the core posts to keep the bird atlas going. And then coming towards the end of my talk now, um, I think one of the problems that bird life faces is it's, it's a danger of becoming a victim of its own success. So it's very easy for us all to sit back and think that Mark and Vernon have put together this wonderful team of professionals who are doing a marvelous job tackling the really big, difficult problems like conservation of African penguins. How can we as individuals really do anything about conservation of African penguins? Or trying to understand the decline of bank cormorants. We don't really understand what's going on, so how can we do something about it? Or how can we tackle problems like power line collisions? You know, it's just, they just seem such big problems. And yes, bird life is doing a wonderful job with the resources they have at their disposal. But bird life is only as powerful as its membership base. So we need to grow the organization. And one of the concerns at the council meeting on was it? When did we say that? Friday. <laughs> Saturday, goodness me, I've lost track. We had the council meeting, is that membership numbers have actually fallen. Um, you know, we really should be growing this organization. We're doing all the right things, but we're not growing the membership. Base. So please encourage all of your bird watching friends to join Bird Life. We're only as powerful as our membership base. And it goes further than that as well. There's a dedicated core of professionals involved with Bird Life, but they wouldn't be able to do a tenth of the things they do if it wasn't for the contribution of all the volunteers who give us their time and expertise in so many ways to keep the organization running. And I, I can't do more than single out one individual, but I just thought he's not here, so I can embarrass him perhaps a little bit. But uh, that rather wrinkly gentleman in the middle there, Dave Whitelaw, has been the chairman of the Cape Bird Club's Conservation Committee for at least 20 years, I think probably close to 25 years. And he's just one example of people who come from ordinary walks of life who make a real difference. Dave looks at all of the impact assessment type exercises going on in the Western Cape and decides which ones are important and which ones bird life should get involved in. And people like that really do make a, a real difference. And obviously all of you have different skills. You might not be able to contribute in that way, but you can all contribute something. As Peter Harrison was saying, we're an important group of people. Um, and just by being members of bird life, we make a contribution. But I think individually, if you look at your life, you can probably do more. And you know, I feel like a bit like one of those rah rah stump up the truth type of thing. But really, it's a it's a really important cause, and I would encourage you to do so because ultimately, you know, I think at the end of the day, we want to be able to look back, like Phil Hockey looks back over his life, and be able to say that we did ultimately make a difference. Thank you. Thank you.